of community. Oh, got it. So this is a group of uh, community ambassadors that are um, advocating for vaccination within their within their community. Not necessarily nurses or doctors here. These are um, these are community members. That is correct. Yes. So okay, uh, community health ambassadors have been leading a lot of the vaccine engagement work in our um, neighborhoods. Great, thank you. So uh, for your context, uh, my name is James Callahan. I'm a registered nurse by background. I originally worked in the emergency department for about six years. And within the last two years, I've been working with the Michael Guerin Hospital infection prevention and control team. The first part of that, I worked in the inside the hospital managing COVID outbreaks and COVID testing within the hospital. And within the last year, I've been working with the community. So we do infection prevention and control and uh, COVID testing for long-term care homes, shelters, congregate living settings, all of those sort of things. So I've, I work very closely with Dr. Jeff Powis and Dr. Janine McCready, who I'm sure you've heard their name in the news. They've helped with the school testing and everything like that. So I get to, um, I, I get to share a lot of that knowledge. So Iman, I, I just clicked to screen to share my screen, and it says um, that you're the, you're the boss of the sh screen sharing. So maybe if you could uh, allow me to share, that'd be great. Yes, I can give you powers. Uh, there you go. Powers, <laughs> great. Okay. How's that? Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Fantastic. All right, so um, all I've done here is I've just copy pasted your questions into the into the chat. I'm going to start at the top. I'm going to work my way through and any questions that come up in between you just uh, pop them into the chat. OK, and I'll try to give you some practical answers. So uh, first one, current isolation guidelines. So for anybody who tests positive for COVID-19, the government recently came out and said that you have to isolate for five days. And everybody was used to having to isolate for 10. So the, the science and the rationale behind the five days is not because it's less infectious. And it's not because it's a good idea. It's because we were really worried in late December, early January, that there wasn't going to be enough people to drive buses, to stock grocery shelves, to show up to nursing homes, to take care of patients. And the rules were for for people that lived in the community that they were gonna only have to isolate for five days from either your symptom onset, or if you didn't have any symptoms, five days from when you had your positive test results. Now, what I'll say is, and what we do here at Michael Guerin, is we think that that's a very silly idea and that anyone who tests positive should really be self-isolating for 10 full days. And the rationale for that is that COVID is, is, uh, is an infectious disease that is most contagious at the beginning of the illness, but tails off to the end. Everybody's immune system is a little bit different and some people will shed the virus and, and they won't be contagious anymore at day 10. And some people will still continue to be contagious 10 days in. So from my perspective, um, if someone tests positive for COVID, you're gonna have them self-isolate for, for 10 days. The way I always do it is uh, in the bottom right-hand corner of my calendar, of my computer, we've got the calendar. I just pull up, uh, the calendar, and then I'll choose uh, one of two dates. If they have symptoms, that's the time that you should self start self-isolating from. So uh, say you test positive, you have symptoms that start on December 1st. So I go from, I put my, my mouse cursor on December 1, I jump down one week, that's December 8, and then uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that would be 10 full days of isolation, the person could come out of isolation on this, on, sorry, December, January, on January 12th. So you just count 10 full days from that time. So one plus 10 equals 11, that's 10 full days. And then the next morning they can come out of isolation. So that's what, that's what I would count. So that's a real inconvenience for a lot of people. And, um, you know, one of the rationales for keeping the isolation date shorter for five days was that the vaccine protected you from, um, from being too contagious. But like we know, the vaccine prevents illness. It does not prevent you from getting COVID. Um, the virus is not gonna run into your mouth and then turn around and run away just because you've been vaccinated, right? You can still get it, but then it's not gonna be able to make you sick. 
So the next question here is about uh, vaccination for children and booster doses. So I just, I just, sorry. Go ahead. I just had a, a follow up question. So um, now that folks aren't testing for COVID-19, are they able to come out of isolation before the 10 day period if they're asymptomatic, like if their symptoms resolve sooner than 10 days? So for community guidelines, um, what you, like you said, a lot of people are not eligible. And if you are a community member and you develop symptoms and you're starting to feel unwell, uh, the guidance right now is that you should just, you should just self-isolate and you should just uh, assume that you have COVID-19 because you don't have access to testing. So for anyone who's going to work or, or you know, I would say definitely you should wait 10 days before going back to work. If you're someone who has someone that is immunocompromised in your family, you should definitely self-isolate for 10 days from that time. If you're an individual who um, is fully vaccinated, you felt you and, you know, you, you, um, if you're, if you're an individual who's fully vaccinated and you're in the community and you're not feeling unwell, you're never going to know you had COVID. So there's no need to self-isolate if you always feel well the whole time. Um, and then if you feel unwell and then it, you recover by five days, you know, I would say that, um, that if you have to go out, then I'd say, you know, you wear a mask the entire time, you wash your hands and you don't expose yourself to anyone who's elderly. You don't expose yourself to anybody who could get really sick. You stay away from children who couldn't be vaccinated in that last half end of the five day period. But the five day isolation period is a recommendation to help the economy going, not because it's something that may, that says that you're less, you're not infectious anymore after five days. Right. Um, and there is another question from Charles in the chat box. What if we still have symptoms after 10 days? Great. So uh, some people still have symptoms that persist beyond 10 days and you should continue to self-isolate until you start to feel better for at least 24 hours. So it's hard, it's hard to suss this out sometimes because you know, you can get COVID and then you have a fever and chills and you can't eat or drink and then you have a terrible cough. Those things will resolve, but sometimes people will have a lingering cough or have lingering long COVID symptoms that persist for months at a time. So how do you, how do you determine what's infectious and what's not? So what I would say is, Charles, you know, 10 days and you're still symptomatic, you know, I would stay, stay in self-isolation until you start to improve for at least 24 hours. And if you still have a cough, but it's not producing anything, it's just a, a residual cough that's maybe post-viral, what we say, or a post you, you were sick, and then the cough is just kind of lingering, it won't go away, it's worse at nighttime. Um, that's not something I would say is communicable anymore. I say that's a, that's a consequence of a viral illness, and it's just a that's a, a souvenir of your, of your illness. And I, I wouldn't say that that's something you need to continue to self-isolate for. Things to continue your isolation period of day 10, continued fevers, continued extreme fatigue. You're still coughing up. You still have a runny nose. And you know some people who are a little bit older are going to have a longer time to, to get better. And some people who, have, who take immunosuppressing medications will take a little bit longer time to get better. But the general rule of thumb is you should be better for at least 24 hours. Um, Tabusum is asking, what if one has tested negative after 10 days of getting a positive result and still has symptoms like headaches and decreased loss of sense of sense and of smell and taste? So uh, Tabusum, the decreased sense of smell and taste, that's more of a Delta variant uh, symptom. And with, with Omicron, the most common sign that symptom we're seeing is sore throat. So what I would say is um, headache, that is, that's still something that I'm say, still saying, you're still sick. You, sh you shouldn't be working if you have a headache. And if you have, um, even if you've tested negative after 10 days of a positive result, that's, so there's another misconception is that once you've tested positive for COVID, you have a, either a positive PCR result or a positive rapid antigen test, you should be excluded from testing uh, for a period of 30 days afterwards. So the test only detects the presence of the virus. So it tests and you put the, the swab in someone's nose and you spin it around and you pull it out, send it to the lab and it says COVID-19 detected. 
That means COVID's present. If you test someone at the beginning of their illness and you test someone at the very end of their illness, sometimes it will still test positive. The important thing is to take that test result in the context of the person's presentation. So even though I had COVID, on day 15 or day 20, uh, day 11 after my symptoms started, I could still test positive. That doesn't mean I'm contagious anymore. And so um, what that means is that the virus is still, is still present. So a good example of this, what I have is, um, here's the virus. I'm drawing a little picture here. It's made up of multiple different things. There's a, the virus has a fat, a fatty layer. I'm going to get rid of my, my screen on the back there. There. So the, the virus has a little, can you see that? There we go. The virus has a body and it's got little spike proteins on the outside. Um, sometimes this virus, once it's older, it's been around for a while, it dies off and only parts, remnants of the virus are still present. And that's what the test is detecting. So if you had symptoms on January 1st, and you tested positive, you should self-isolate for 10 days until you feel better. You should not be testing yourself after you had COVID again, because you're likely going to continue to test positive, but that test is only picking up dead virus that's not contagious anymore. So you should exempt yourself from testing for about 10 days after that result. Does that answer the question? Some people suffer from a lot of weakness and lingering cough even after 10 to 15 days. Yes, can they stop isolation? I'm gonna say yes. So um, lingering cough, that's just a consequence of having COVID-19. But if it's a cough that's productive, you're coughing and a lot of gunk is coming up, your nose is still running, then I'm gonna say you need, you need to continue to isolate. And uh, a lot of weakness, yes. I think that you know, uh, uh, COVID is, is very difficult on people and does make people weak. The things that I'm concerned about that I would consider the extending the length of isolation would be runny nose, would be continued sore throat and fevers that continue to go on. Um, if that's the case at, at 10 days after your illness, you know, I I'd also I'd go to your doctor because you may have uh, may have some some uh, you may have some serious illness that needs to be um, addressed and you may need some medical attention. I hope that helps answer the, the question. I'll move on to uh, vaccination and child, for children and booster doses. Okay, so um, the NACI just came out and the, that's the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. They just changed their recommendation for vaccination for children to should. It's a very different thing from, from recommend. Now the, the Canadian Immunization Council is saying you should vaccinate your children. So for kids, the vaccine that we're giving is a half dose of, it's, it's a third of a dose of the Pfizer vaccine. And the rationale for that is that we're not giving a half dose because it's, um, because they're smaller bodies. When you are, when you're giving medications that, that are for the immune system, you, you don't base, you don't dose the medication based on weight you dose based on what's called their immunogenicity, their ability to create an immune response. Young kids' immune systems are so strong and so responsive, they need less vaccine to create the same amount. So right now, kids uh, from 5 to 11 are, should, are recommended, should get a, the Pfizer vaccine, um, and they should get two doses. The other recommendation came out is any children that have immune system problems should have three doses. Now, the rationale for that, you hear immunocompromised. What does that mean? That means, you know, I'm immunocompromised. Do I need an extra shot? The rationale for that is that if you're immunocompromised, you get the vaccine, your body, your immune system just isn't going to be as strong and as effective at making antibodies as someone who's got a strong immune system would be. So for kids, they're saying two doses. For kids with immune system issues, there should be three doses. There's another question down here. So after 10 days isolation, can we still transmit the virus for the next few days? So Tabzum, uh, the question, the answer to that is at 10 days of isolation, if you're feeling better and you're feeling well, no, you're not able to, um, to transmit the virus. But at 10 days and you're still feeling sick, you still have a runny nose and fever and cough, 
Yes, you can. And it's not going to be a perfect timeline for everybody. Everyone's immune system is different and everybody is going to be able to, um, some people's immune systems will shed the virus right away. And some people's immune systems won't be able to get rid of the virus. I see Razia has her hand up. As you mentioned, kids uh, with immunocompromised um, so who are immunocompromised need uh, the three doses. Yep. So what are the timing for those? So is it 84 days from the second uh, dose? And yes, so, so do, do they need a letter from a doctor to get that as well? For the booster dose, they'll need a, they'll need a, a letter. So, and then if you want, and you really are, are eager to have your child have um, their second dose sooner than that, they can have it administered by the product monogram time timeline, which is would be 21 days. But what I recommend is, is waiting the timeline in between because time in between allows for the immune system to um, have a, a stronger response with the immune, with the antibody levels. I see Sadaf is asking why a booster for 12 to 17 is not recommended. So the, the boosters for 12 to 17 year olds um, they haven't recommended it yet because the same thing, children's immune systems are much more reactive and are stronger than, than, than people who are a little bit older. So I'm sure boosters will be recommended for them sooner. Um, and the other thing is that a lot of 12 to 17 year olds aren't the same amount of time away from their second dose as a lot of the adult population is. And question two, do we need another vaccine for Omicron as Pfizer is doing the clinical trials? So what I'll, Dr. Powis's answer to this is that we should not be, we should not be tailoring vaccines to specific, um, specific variants of concern. So the rationale for that is that uh, the variants change all the time. So since I've been in infection control, we've had the native variant. We've had alpha, beta, delta, gamma, now Omicron, and there was mu. So it changes so fast and the variants are are named because so because they have little variations on the outside. So COVID is a coronavirus. It's called a coronavirus because it's got little spikes on the outside of it. And uh, the Latin word for that is, is crown, corona. So that's why it's called a coronavirus. It's much better to create a, an, a vaccine that targets coronaviruses than specific variants because the variants change so fast. That's the little crown on the outside. Omicron has a, a different crown than other COVID does. And so by, if we chase after Omicron's crown and create a vaccine by the time it's created, by the time it's distributed, by the time it's tested and given, we're gonna we, you're gonna have a different variant. Um, and don't be surprised when another variant comes around because that's the virus's job. Its job is to get into your body and make copies of itself and then when it makes an error, that's when a variant comes up. It's um, the way I picture it is uh, the virus gets into someone's body and it starts to make copies of itself. And so that's when the virus gets in and then it uses your own biology to create more copies. But it's like, it's, a, it's, it's doing a really bad job typing and it's typing a letter really fast. And you know, when I type really fast, I make lots of spelling mistakes. And that's what's happening with COVID. It's getting into people's bodies who are immunocompromised or not vaccinated. And a lot of people in South Africa, where the um, Omicron variant came from, have HIV and have, uh, are not vaccinated. And um, that's a very well-known fact that, that they've had that. And because these people have weak immune systems, the virus gets in and just starts replicating like crazy. It makes lots of mistakes. And, and when it makes a mistake, sometimes those mistakes, when it's replicating itself, give it a biological advantage. And that's what happened here with Omicron. It was so effective. It made a mistake in the typing, and uh, it it made it, it made a mistake, and that mistake was very biologically advantageous. So it was able to jump around and around, and so that's that's what happened there. Um, just a quick a quick analogy of what a vaccine does. So the vaccine does not contain COVID. The vaccine is only contains mRNA. It's messenger RNA. That's like an instruction kit. So, you know, you get a, an instruction kit from, you buy something from Ikea and you get the box and it open up the instructions and it shows you how to build it. 
When you get the vaccine in your arm, that's the that's an instruction kit for your body to create antibodies to um, protect yourself from COVID. So a great example that I like to give is that here is a COVID-19 virus. This is the coronavirus is my hand. And this key is the S protein. That's the, that's the spike protein. That's the, the crown on the coronavirus. And a key for, my, for a door is the entrance to the body. So when COVID gets into someone's body and they're not vaccinated, the key can just go right into the door handle, open up, and then the virus can get right in. When you're vaccinated or you've had uh, opportunity to create antibodies, think of uh, the antibody as a piece of gum. So earlier I stuck a piece of gum in my mouth, I chewed it out and I put it on the piece of paper. I don't know if you saw that, but imagine antibodies, you get the vaccine and then it's an instruction kit, how to make antibodies. The antibodies are in your blood. So when COVID comes and then COVID gets stuck on the end of the key and imagine trying to open a, a, a lock, but there's gum on the end of the key, you can't get in. And that's what the COVID vaccine does. And so I've got one vaccine, you know, that's one piece of gum on my key. I got two vaccines, you put another piece of gum, you get three vaccines, you put more and the more gummed up, those antibodies float around in your body. And when COVID enters, it jumps on and it blocks it. And then COVID just can't get in because there's gum on the key and it doesn't, the lock doesn't work anymore. So that's, that's the rationale. That's the analogy, you know, I tell people is you want to gum up the works. So when COVID comes in, the key doesn't work. It can't get into your body. So um, I think I've answered number four about the vaccination for Omicron variant. Right now, the, what we're seeing is for adults, three doses of the, of the COVID vaccine is very effective and, and really prevents, I don't like using numbers like 87% or 90% effective. What I like are tangible things that are like real outcomes. And three doses of the vaccine prevents hospitalization and prevents you from getting seriously ill. And those are two things that I think that you guys as community ambassadors can use that are, that are realistic things that your community members that you're gonna be talking to can grab onto and hold on to. You know, you know 67% effective, 87%, or if I, get two, if I get three doses, I'm not gonna end up in the hospital. That's something I can understand and that's a, that's a real valuable goal that I can go from there. Um, the question about vaccine shopping, you know, uh, one of the things that came up is that Iman was saying is that the, your community seems to have a real preference for Pfizer. And, you know, that is what it is. Um, but from my perspective, there's no difference between Pfizer and Moderna. And actually the best combination <laughs> seems to be Moderna, Moderna, Moderna is, uh, is what the, the new data is showing. So myself, um, I'm a hospital worker. So I got Pfizer for all three. And that's because Pfizer, when, it, when the COVID first started, it needed to have, um, need to be kept at minus 70 degrees. That's because the mRNA is, is so fragile that it needs to be kept really cold. And if it's, if it, um, mRNA totally disintegrates in your body within 24 hours of administration, nothing is left over. And the vaccine needs to be kept really, really cold. And in the beginning of the pandemic, they used Pfizer because it, it couldn't be transported very well. And then we gave Moderna, which could be transported very well, which is a little bit more stable to the long-term care residents. And that was a good thing because it actually showed that Moderna is, has a higher, can have um, longer lasting antibodies. We call that the durability of those antibodies. They, they seem to last for a very long time. Um, Moderna came up with the mRNA vaccine first. They were the first ones that did it. And then Pfizer copied them. The Moderna vaccine actually has more mRNA per shot than the Pfizer does. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, I think maybe the, the idea that Pfizer's better comes from the fact that all of the healthcare workers got Pfizer. But the rationale for that is that at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't have a good way to deliver Pfizer in the community because it needed to be kept at minus 70 degrees. And it was easy to give Pfizer to the healthcare workers that were already in the hospital and give Moderna to the long-term care home residents because we could e more easily transport it. So I think that that's where that misconception comes from. If you're gonna ask me, there's no difference between Pfizer and Moderna. I, I say uh, like Apple, 
oh, what do you call it? Uh, apple, apple, or orange apple. It's all, it's all the same. Like um, whatever, if people want uh, Pfizer and that's what's going to get it into their arm, they're very adamant about that. Pfizer is becoming more available now. We, Michael Guerin has a larger stock of it. Um, and if they really want it, they can request it. But Moderna is much more um, available for us. And it's easier to make sure that we're giving the right amount for it. So uh, just some questions are jumping up here. So uh, Tasmina is saying, when you do, we do outreach in the community, residents have questions like, why is there a sudden spike in COVID cases even after taking the booster doses? Are vaccines not effective against Omicron? Uh, vaccines are very effective against Omicron. So um, what we're seeing in the long-term care homes is I worked through the first wave. Um, there were no vaccines at all. COVID got in there and the amount of death that I saw was unprecedented. I've never seen so many dead bodies um, in my career as a nurse. Now, um, with this fourth, with this new wave, the Omicron wave, we're seeing way more cases in the long-term care homes, but none of them are dying. And so, yes, Omicron is more transmissible. It's getting everywhere, and its job it made a it it uh, changed. It made lots of opportunities. It's jumping around, and it's more contagious. So more people are getting it, um, but it's not making people nearly as sick because they're vaccinated. The vaccine is very effective at preventing that illness. So. Um, they are very effective against illness for Omicron. It doesn't necessarily protect you from getting the virus because the virus can enter your, your body, right? The virus gets in your body through the wet spots on your face. It's your eyes that are moist, the inside of your nose and your mouth. If COVID gets onto your skin, your skin's a very good barrier. You cannot get sick from that. COVID, the virus needs to get into your, the wet spot. And that's where it's able to use the key to enter the body and then start to replicate. So what I would say is um, it's very effective. And to answer why do so many people who are vaccinated and boosted have COVID-19? It's because most people have are vaccinated. 90% of Toronto is vaccinated. So there's more people. There's, there's a higher group, a higher proportion of people to catch the virus. Uh, Sadaf is asking, how long should wait should one wait for a vaccine after infection? So um, you should wait 30 days. I know that the uh, provincial government said you can get vaccinated 10 days after, but really uh, the recommendation from our infectious disease doctors here at the hospital is that you should wait 30 days. So uh, same thing, I open up the calendar on the bottom of my computer in the bottom right. Say I test positive uh, for COVID today on January 27th. I would be eligible for vaccination on February 27th. I would just jump a month. Now, what if I never had any symptoms, but I had a positive test? I would go from the positive test date and just stay one month after that result. That's when I would, I would say. So you just jump one month. Uh, I'm gonna do my best to pronounce your name. Dharma Goda is asking, once you test positive for COVID, how long will you get the same result? Uh, great question. So there's two types of tests that most people have access to. One is a rapid antigen test and one is a PCR test. Rapid antigen tests, you'll really only test positive for the time that you're infectious. So we, so um, rapid antigen tests tell you if you're infectious and PCR tests tell you if you're infected. The difference between the two is that Rapid antigen tests only pick up what I call spicy COVID, really contagious, infectious COVID. And PCR tests will pick up the COVID when it's in your body, but not you're not sick yet. And it'll also pick up the dead virus that's still lingering, that just hasn't been able to clear out of your body. So uh, for rapid antigen tests, you'll usually test positive for about a whole week during your illness. You'll probably won't test positive on it um, after your 10 day isolation period. Whereas PCR tests, you can test positive for up to 90 days, up to three months. But again, um, every positive result needs to be taken in the context of when did the positive result match the symptoms? Charles is uh, asking, for the wording change, kids should get vaccinated rather than recommended. Where can we find this reference? Sure. Um, Charles, I will send this to Iman after the chat. I have the email from the NASI recommendation. Uh, I'm just writing this down here. 
Iman. And this is the should recommendation. Neil is asking, uh, likely also Pfizer is just a well-known familiar name brand. I'm gonna agree with Neil on that one. Maria Dasu is saying, that's what I've found, Neil. Folks are much more familiar with Pfizer. Yep. Um, Pfizer is, uh, is a well-known brand for, um, they make Viagra, they make lots of other pills. And I think that that, uh, that brand power is something that sticks. We need to deconstruct, reiterate, debunk, breakthrough infection, mixed messages. Key is less adverse outcomes. Yeah, no, I would agree. So what Neil, for what Neil, Neil's mentioning, you know, COVID doesn't, uh, the vaccine doesn't stop you from getting COVID. It stops the severity of illness. So like I said, when the, when the virus gets in, it tries to use the key to open up the door. Once it gets in, all the gum, all those antibodies jump onto the key and then the key isn't able to open up more doors and make more copies of itself because it, it stops and mutes the symptoms. I see Maria has her hand up. Hey, um, yeah, I just had a question. A lot of our ambassadors have been getting, um, you know, comments and questions from residents who are saying, you know, why should I get my booster if Omicron is such a, is, is a variant that really doesn't impact me? I'm not going to die from it. So what's the point of getting it? That's been a huge, huge um issue that's been coming up. And I, I just want to know, even as for myself, when working with the ambassadors and for ambassadors on the ground, how can they respond to someone who is saying that? Um, you know, we even had a case at one of our town halls where a woman was, you know, saying how herself and her children are not vaccinated with any dose, whereas her husband has all three doses. And she's like, we all got sick. So what's the point? Why did he end up getting vaccinated? Um, and thank God TPH was there to answer that question because I wouldn't have been able to. Um, yeah, yeah. But our ambassadors get this question every day. So hopefully you can help us answer that. Yeah, sure. So like, what's the point? Uh, why should I is a, is a big one. Um, well, what I'm, what I'm going to say is that, you know, COVID is not going to kill everybody, but there are a lot of long-term consequences of viral illness that we don't always hear about. Um, lots of people end up with what's called long COVID and they have persistent brain fog. They have, um, ex they experience prolonged fatigue for a long time. They have uh, weakness or difficulty breathing and, and these symptoms can last. So it's not just about, um, it's not just about dying. It's also about the consequence of illness. A lot of, you know, I'm going to say, I've seen a lot of people that end up with, um, with COVID that come to the hospital, they spend two weeks in bed and they're not the same after they leave. They're not dead, but they're not the same. And the rationale for getting a booster dose is that the, the immune system works in, in waves. You get a dose and that gives you that boost of protection. Over time, your antibodies wane. That's the same for all vaccines. You know, I've had three doses of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine when I was uh, a child. And uh, then I got a booster a little while ago. Um, I had, uh, I, I get a booster for my Tdap, my tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis vaccine every 10 years. Um, and I always, I get lots of boosters because I, I know that my immune system is always working. Since the time that we've had this conversation that I've been here talking to you, my immune system has, has killed cancer cells that have started in my body and, um, and the, my immune system just killed them. And giving them a vaccine is just another, another way for them to, another way for that, for the, it's another job for the immune system to do. You know, the, another example I give is that my wife gives me lots of jobs to do around the house. And uh, sometimes she just adds on one more. And that's the same as when you get a vaccine. Your immune system's working all day long already. And then you get a vaccine, it get, has one more job, just create more antibodies. So I think that the answer to like, you know, we all got sick and what's the point is that family got lucky. And there are some families that, um, that lose family members. They lose patriarchs, matriarchs of the family. And then there are some families that don't necessarily have family members die, but then they have the breadwinner of the family is, has chronic illness and is not able to work and provide 
anymore. And every for, for adults to get that third dose, that's reducing the risk and it mitigates the chance that of severe illness and outcome. I'll tell you, our hospital has just last week reached our max of COVID patients we've ever had throughout the whole pandemic. We had two full units, 80 patients admitted with COVID-19 to our hospital, some of them as young as, as 32 years old. So I'm not going to take that chance. I'm going to take a, a mild inconvenience and take a vaccine. And I'm not going to put it up to, to uh, I'm not going to take the chance. So maybe I, I hope that that helps answer that yeah, question. For sure. And uh, that's what that's, I'd say. It's Yeah, I like the idea and, and the, the concept of like, this, this booster in the vaccine is, is adding to your immune system. Like it's just helping your, it's just giving your immune system another job to do. Um, so hopefully our ambassadors can take that with them. I will too. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. Uh, Razia has got her hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. This is the approach I uh, respond to that uh, sometimes depending on who I'm talking with, I, I, approached them with a question. So do you think the booster really helped you so that your symptom wasn't uh, as bad mm -hmm. than others? So most of the cases that I have had the individual saying, actually, you know what? Yeah, you are right. So when they say it themselves, I, I find they're able to internalize what they're saying as well. And, and then it creates another conversation from there. And then recently one individual was very happy coming towards me. I know he only had one vaccine and telling me, hey, Razia, guess what? I'm like, what? He's like, our whole family was affected by COVID. And he was so happy and thrilled about it. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry to know. He's like, no, 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 don't be. Because we all um, recovered from it very well, despite yeah. being our vaccine status. I'm like, oh my God, that tells me how strong you are. But guess what? I am not that strong. So please continue wearing the mask and I'll talk to you soon when you're ready for your uh, second dose. And I <laughs> laughed at that because he is nowhere close to what I'm gonna say at that point about vaccine. So instead I gave him the window to think about, and I know he won't be able to get the vaccine now given the 30 days that you're saying. So I will touch base with him in a couple of weeks to see how things are going because he does have an immunocompromised individual at home. Uh, so that I want to build on uh, on a conversation and hopefully they will get their second dose soon. Yeah, thanks, Razia. I think that you make a really good point. Um, it's not, it's, uh, it's, it's, you, you're using positive reinforcement and that's, uh, that's a really great strategy when it comes to people who are hesitant. If someone doesn't want the vaccine, you know, and they still haven't got it at this point, or they're, they're hesitant to get the booster, um, you know, it's, it's uh, they're probably have their reasons for that. And an important thing to do is to validate that concern. It's, you know, sometimes I even get frustrated myself and, uh, and I, I get angry or upset or something like that. But, you know, people, you're going to be able to connect more with someone if you find common ground with them. And when they say that they don't want the vaccine because they, they're worried about the side effects to them, I said, you know what, my response is always, what I hear is that you're concerned about your health and you care about your well-being. And so that's, and you say, you know, and I care about my health. And, and so that's a common ground that you can meet those individuals at. Um, and then the next piece, Razia, is that you used a story. Stories are very, very powerful. And if by collecting all of these stories and sharing it with them, it makes it real for people. And that's a really powerful tool as a community health ambassador, something that you can use. I'm just gonna scroll down here with a couple of these um, other questions. So Taz, Taz, Tabazum is asking, why is there a sudden spike in COVID cases in the communities? Omicron is so contagious. Uh, Omicron, other, other um, COVID, other COVID-19 was uh, not as contagious as this. It is just so contagious. Also, it's getting colder outside and people are moving indoors. And when you're indoors, there's more opportunity for the virus to kind of float into the environment a little bit more and the wind doesn't blow it away and people are indoors and they're usually with people that they know and they take their masks off. We're not seeing nurses getting COVID in the hospital. Nurses and PSWs are catching COVID in the community and bringing it to the hospital. Karma is asking, what would you advise what would your advice be for people who are being asked to provide a negative test after getting COVID to return to work? 
the I'm going to say before I finish reading it, your employer is asking something that's unreasonable. Employers are asking for this. How would it be possible that one could test positive? Yeah. So, um, Karma, you know, you employers should not be asking for a positive test after an infection or a negative test after an infection to return to work. It's not a reasonable thing. And if uh, your employer is giving you difficulty, you can you can ask them to reach out to myself. I'm happy to talk to the employer and let them know that it's not a reasonable thing. Um, after someone tests positive for COVID and they had symptoms and they've been their isolation period, they need to be exempt from testing for 30 days. Uh, so not a reasonable request. And we correct that with a lot of employers. Aman is asking, what is the best way for a parent or caregiver to prepare an autistic child for an upcoming COVID-19 vaccine appointment? So uh, what I would say is you have to be honest with the children. The vaccine, uh, getting a needle is a little bit painful. Um, you know, uh, you can't say it doesn't hurt because when it does hurt, then you've lost that trust. So you say, you know, it does hurt and um, it will be a little bit sore, but, but acknowledging that and, and validating their feelings, validating their fear and letting them know that it's okay for them to be scared is a very valuable way to do it. If you're going to go to our Thorncliffe, Pug, our Thorncliffe hub, and get vaccinated there. We have a child life specialist there. They are excellent at having distracted, um, distracting activities. They have something called Amatop, A-M-E-T-O-P. That's, a, that's a, a numbing gel that you can put on top of the skin before the vaccine is given. We used to give it in the emergency department before we uh, administered shots to children all the time. And then the other thing is, uh, I'd say for an autistic child is to bring someone that they trust and bring someone strong um, that can hold them. I would also say, don't let the child see the needle. So, um, you know, uh, what I would do is if it was my child, I would hold the child. I would have them sit in my lap facing me with my head here, their face facing that way. And I would give them a bear hug, hold them nice and safe to not only protect the vaccinator, uh, but also protect the child. And I would hold them really tight and close. I would tell them, you know, I love you, you're safe. This is going to pinch a little bit and, and go for it from there. So Iman, I, I hope that that's helpful. Also, um, you know, um, if uh, you are really concerned for safety and you think it's reasonable, uh, you could consult with the child's family physician and maybe they can give you a one-time dose of a uh, medication that can help relax them. Something like one milligram of lorazepam that would be in my mind, a really reasonable thing to do in the event to, to make sure that they get vaccinated. Uh, Tazuma is saying, with two doses of vaccine, are we still protected? You're still protected, but less protected. Three doses is really what the vaccine is, really where the protection from Omicron is coming from. And I don't have the data to back that up yet because Omicron is so new, but anecdotally, from my experience here in the hospital, that's what I can tell you. Our long-term care home residents have four doses, some of them, and some of them have three. And the most illness we're seeing in the long-term care home residents that have COVID are just, um, just a runny nose and a sore throat and maybe a fever. But if you really want that extra protection, it's likely this is a three-dose vaccine. Razia, you have your hand up. Sorry, I'm just going back to your previous questions about giving a dose of lorazepam. Uh, how would that get done? Because at the clinics, it, it's not available, not that I think anyone would have that available. So, so I mean, you'd have to go to your family doctor. They could give exactly. you a, a, a prescription for one. The way I would do it is I'd go to the, I'd talk to my family doctor who I have a, a relationship with that knows this child is, has anxiety or maybe are, is autistic and say, I'm very concerned for the phys my physical safety, my child's physical safety and the safety of the team at the vaccine clinic. I'd like to I'd like to give them something to help them relax. And you can get a one-time dose from a pharmacy, administer it um, one hour before you go to the, to the clinic. This is just a recommendation. Yeah, um, so this is you just have to find a family physician who would be willing to do this. Okay, so just a basically for our role would be communicating with the family saying, connect with your doctor. If we come across with any questions like how do we keep our uh, the kids' anxiety level low for vaccine or fear or whatever? Mm -hmm. So we'll just refer them back to the doctor. That's what I would say. Right? And yeah. 
Uh, yeah, that's what I would say. You but I think for us, your... it's too much when we go into lorazepam and what it does and totally. you know, all that affects, yeah. So that when I say lorazepam, I'm, sp I'm speaking specifically about uh, autistic children. In the emergency department, we have many um, presentations of children that have autism with uh, acute social crisis. And the family members that I know, um, they're very familiar with these medications and they know the medications that work for their child. And that's why I say, talk to your doctor about something is a good strategy yeah. um, beforehand. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm aware of lorazepam. That's why I was asking, how do we tell the pa parents is, instead of say, giving the information this way, we just yeah. tell them to create a plan with, with your family doctor is what yeah, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, James, sorry, I just have like my eye on the clock as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can just go through the questions in the chat box. Um, sure, sure. Um, Neil is saying helpful. I'll do my best. Okay. So Neil is saying helpful education, uh, waning, reducing the time vaccination protection between second and third. Is this a question or a comment, Neil? Just taking this as reflection back for us um, to have some talking points in the community, ambassadors, because I think we see this a lot. Um, yeah. Why don't you the third dose, uh, breakthrough infections, waning protection, those kind of pieces. You got it. Waning is a great word for it. And um, your antibody levels come up and then they, they wane over time and then they reduce. So the sooner you are to your vaccine, uh, the, the higher level of uh, antibodies you have in your body. Um, so Abdul saying some youth 12 to 29 years old who got their Moderna shot first and second shot prefer to get Moderna as booster because they don't want to mix shots. Do you have an option for them? So um, they don't want to mix shots. So if they've got two Moderna, they'll be able to easily get Moderna. And uh, within the last two weeks, there's been an increase in Pfizer. I'm sure you're going to be able to get Pfizer as well. You call the clinics ahead of time. There's no issue with mixing any mRNA shot. It's actually probably very beneficial because it's going to give you, um, give you, it's, it's going to give you different, your body, different set of instructions to create M mRNA. Um, there's no issue with mixing and matching Pfizer and Moderna. Abdul is saying, if the perception that Omicron is milder and compared to Delta, why are we witnessing such a higher number of deaths? The, the simple answer to that is um, Omicron is less, is maybe milder, but twice as infectious. So if it's half as it deadly and, twi and twice as infectious, that's the same amount, right? Just as many people are getting it. Um, and also it's finally reaching a whole bunch of people that are unvaccinated and some people get vaccinated. They do all the right things, but their bodies are, they have immunocompromising conditions. So their bodies, even though they get the vaccine, they fail to mount that response and create the antibodies that they need. And it puts them at risk. Uh, how can, Karma saying, how can we respond to individuals who have severe reactions to vaccines and now feel unsure uh, about the vaccine and may influence others as well? So, you know, uh, severe reactions. Um, some people get very hot and cold and are very unwell. Um, you know, that's for 24 hours after. And uh, I'd say that, you know, that's much better than ending up in the ICU or ending up in the hospital, ending up with nasal, having to use oxygen for, for weeks at a time. And um, I'd say, severe reaction, I think, are very uncommon. Uh, I'll tell you anecdotally that uh, I know an individual um, who was taking people's cash to go get the vaccine uh, with their health card so that they could have, people could have fake uh, passport, fake vaccine passports. This individual had over 30 doses of Pfizer. And I'll tell you, you know what? He was totally fine. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with him. He was totally... There is, he had no side effects, no concerns. Um, we did we did ban him from the vaccine clinics, um, but there was no side effects for him. The way I'm, I'm sharing that because the vaccine is safe. It's, it's totally safe. Uh, so Dr. Muhammad Aid is, um, so uh, Iman, I'm, I'm seeing that there's still like 17 questions here. I'm happy to stick around for a little bit longer to run through some of these if people are interested. Sure, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the airport, you're tested, if you are tested positive 10 to 180 days prior to come to Canada, they 
no PCR test for you. Yes, that's right. Because that's because the PCR test just detects the presence of the virus. Tabism is asking, how do we convince parents who do not want to vaccinate their kids five to 11? Some say that kids get infected, they have a strong immune system and their system, their symptoms will be mild. The studies initially have also shown proof that it is not fatal for kids. Where are the key words to bring them on the fence at least? So um, what I will say for that is if, um, they, if they think that their kids are not going to get sick, um, that's, that's not always the case. We're finally seeing pediatric hospitalizations from Omicron. Omicron is behaving a lot like other uh, respiratory viruses like, um, R like RSV, respiratory cyclical virus or influenza, and it's making kids, uh, children very sick. What I would say is not only um, is there a risk of them getting sick and having it behave like croup or RSV, it's also, um, there's a, a risk of something called multi-system inflammatory, um, inflammatory disorder, which causes a organ dysfunction amongst children. It's not a risk that I, want, I would wanna take. What I would say is this vaccine is the most administered medication of all time. Over 7 billion doses of the vaccine have, have been given and it's, it's been shown to be safe. I'm gonna get my, vaccine, my, my child vaccinated as soon as he is eligible. And Tapism, what I would say is find examples of parents who have given their kids the vaccine and, they, and show them that the kids are fine and the kids are safe and use those stories to help bring these families forward. And finally, Tapism, acknowledge the parents' fear. Same thing, it's the same technique. I hear that you care about your children's health and I see that you want to protect your kids and make sure that they're safe. So th th that's something that I would say. How uh, Eshrath M66 is saying, how long after getting COVID-19 can one get COVID-19 dose three? Uh, so right now it's three months is, uh, is, the do is the waiting time. Oh, sorry. How long after getting COVID can you get the vaccine? It's, it's one month. So if I get COVID, if I test positive on January 27th, I can get vaccinated February 27th. You just jump back a month. And um, if they end up being asymptomatic, and they never have symptoms, but they have a positive test, go from the positive test date. I may, I may have answered all the questions there. Um, so then just going back to the, um, to the original questions that I may not have not gotten to, what approaches can we take to communicate with Moderna who have a strong negative opinion on Moderna? So what I'm going to say is um, Pfizer and Moderna are the same medication. It's the same. It's just a different brand. Um, validate, same thing here. Validate their concern about the safety of Moderna. Moderna was uh, recommended for, for a half dose for adults um, age 30 to 69 and then a full dose above because of a risk of uh, myocarditis. So you may, you may hear about that, heart inflammation. So um, myocarditis, in my opinion, is in something that I've heard from some of the physicians here is that, you know, myocarditis is very common in young adolescent males. And over the past year, a lot of young adolescent males have uh, got vaccinated. And every side effect that is that's noted from vaccine has to get reported. One of the side effects of the pneumo of the um, of one of the childhood vaccines, I'm, I'm forget the name of it, um, after the vaccine was administered, a child was in, that was in the clinical trial was playing on the monkey bars and fell and broke their arm. And the vaccine had to report that uh, broken arms are, side, are a possible side effect of the vaccine. So I think that, um, you know, they reduced the half dose because there's to Moderna for some adults because they're saying that same thing, immuno immune medications are dosed based on the immune system response, not based on weight. So they're seeing that a half dose of Moderna in young adults was enough to produce the antibodies needed. So what I would say is, you know, if they don't want Moderna, they only want Pfizer. Um, validate that. You say, I hear, I understand that you think that Pfizer is the better option, um, but really that they're the same medication. They're both mRNA. The difference between mRNA and older vaccines the older vaccines are viral vector vaccines. So they use a, uh, what's called a dead 
adenovirus. It's like a common cold they, and they use it, they attenuate it, they kill it and make it very weak. And they put the information for COVID in that, or for the in, for influenza in the, vac, in the dead virus and they inject it. Then your body identifies it and creates antibodies. mRNA is a brand new technology um, that, that creates, uh, is, is an instruction kit to create antibodies. But the other thing is mRNA is not brand new. It's been around for over a decade and all of these vaccines were being studied and mRNA was being used to be created in, um, for SARS-CoV-1, for original SARS vaccines. They're also working to use mRNA vaccines to prevent illnesses like MS and cancer. And you can anticipate that all future vaccines are going to be mRNA because it's just so much more effective. Will there need a booster shot at regular intervals uh, going forward? What I'm going to say is probably, um, you know, I think that COVID likely is a pandemic, which means the whole world is affected. Epidemic means um, it comes in waves in, in like this. And then endemic is something like tuberculosis that is always present in a population in some countries that's always like that. So COVID-19 is a seasonal virus and it's going to come up and get better and worse. And I could, I, I foresee a future where we're going to get your flu shot and your COVID shot and they're going to be combined and it's going to be an mRNA shot. And you're going to get it in November when this, when the flu season's coming. And uh, you know, for me, like I said, my immune system's already killed a bunch of cancer cells that we've been, since we've been talking, my immune system's got lots of stuff that it's doing it. Um, I don't want, I don't clean my phone enough. And, uh, and my phone is probably very dirty and I'm texting it all day and then I'll touch my face and then it kills whatever bacteria entered my body. My immune system kills it then. So giving it another shot, just another job. Uh, for kids, is it required by law to give vaccinations? It is not. I doubt that it will ever be required by law for children to go to school. Um, and I, I don't think that that's going to, to be something that's ever going to happen, um, mandating it for children. But, um, you know, for adults, uh, a lot of the things that you need a vaccine passport for, those are privileges, um, going to restaurants, uh, all going to movie theaters, those aren't your rights, those are privileges. And we live in a society and uh, COVID-19 is a communicable disease and we all live in a community and we do it for each other. Uh, kid vaccine side effects. So uh, common side effects of the vaccine for children are sore arm, are fatigue and weakness, which you know I always love when I take my son to the pediatrician, give him the flu shot, because I know he's gonna sleep all night because they get real tired. And uh, sometimes kids will have fevers after, after they have a, a vaccine. And that's just the body um, responding. That's an immune response as opposed to an illness. And fourth dose availability to the public. You don't need a fourth dose right now. I think that the vaccine is really effective after three. I think that maybe next year in the fall, there's gonna be fourth doses available. The fourth doses are were given to the long-term care residents because they're what we call immunosenescent, and that's different than immunocompromised. Immunocompromised means your immune system is just not as strong as everybody else's. Immunosenescent is that you're a little bit, your immune system's a little weaker, it's a little sleepier, just like grandma and papa are, you know, uh, they're a little bit, they don't have the same kick that they used to. So that's why we give that, we gave them a fourth dose and that really helped. Can you spell that? Immunosenescent? Yeah, immunosenescent. Now let me type that in the chat here. I'm a better typer than I am a immunosenescent. Well, oh, I spelled it wrong. Immunosenescent. It's like, uh, I love this word because it, it makes you sound so smart, you know, when you're talking and then uh, it, it doesn't mean immunocompromised. It just means a little bit weaker and doesn't have the same kick as as you used to. Yeah, because we've, we've heard immunocompromised quite often in the past few months, but never immunosenescent. This is the first immunosenescent. Time. Yeah, so a lot of the people in the long term care homes are immunosenescent because they they don't have the same. Um, I know that when my grandfather was at the end of his life, he only could really eat very soft things, and so he's not getting the same protein that his body needs to create the antibodies. So his his immune system was weaker and just didn't have the same 
punch as it used to when he was a little bit older. Yes, and I think that's an important difference to know. All right, I'm I'm looking here. Um, I'm going to send you Iman the the update for should. I think I actually have it right here. And I'm gonna put the put it into the chat, and then um, we will go. Uh, let me see if my computer will load. You know, Iman, um, can you type your email in the in sure. the group chat, and I'll just I'm gonna forward this to you, and you can share with everybody. Great. That was brilliant, James. Thank you so much. Uh, lots of great information. I especially love the analogies and all the examples and the stories. I think that makes it easier for us to understand, but also um, it helps us when we are you know, having these conversations in the community as well. It just kind of breaks down some of the clinical pieces and just make it, makes it more relatable uh, as we're having um, discussions with uh, residents. And I want to extend a thank you to all of you for all of the work that you're doing on a community level. Um, you know, I know that a lot of people are hesitant because they don't like the government telling them what to do. But what they do, what does work is when community members that they know and trust and that they have the idea that you have their best interests in mind um, are telling them to do it. You know, that's really, really powerful. And I'm so grateful. And I know that Dr. Powis and all of Michael Guerin is very grateful for the work that you do. Um, and, you know, you've made our job at the hospital much easier because the, the burden of illness is much lower now that all of these community members have their vaccine. And you, all the work that you've done, all those people that have got their vaccine, they've got their booster, they didn't end up in the hospital. That's made it easier for the nurses and the PSWs, the housekeepers, all the food service workers here, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the effort that you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Great, so um, if there's any other questions, you know, feel free to, to reach out to Iman and, and myself or, my, um, or some members of my team will be able to respond to you and um, we, can, we can give you these answers. If it's gonna be helpful, we can, we can set up another one. And um, I, I really hope that I was able to give you some good analogies. So, uh, you know, my suggestion is when you're talking to people, you know, bring a key with you, bring some gum and stick it on and show them how difficult it is to open the door up. That's why the vaccine works. Because look, COVID can't get in. Awesome. Thank you so much. Lots of thanks for going in, in the chat box as well. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much for uh, going over time and addressing all those questions that uh, we had. And um, we'll circle back. We'll uh, continue having these conversations and uh, we may bug you for a few more of these sessions so that we can keep ourselves updated. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Iman. Thanks, everyone, for your time. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good thank, you. Bye. thank you. Thank you, Iman.